Let's turn today to Mark's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 29. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. This is just before Jesus was going to Gethsemane and he told them that all of you are going to be falling away because the word of God says, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Verse 27. But Peter, the one who is always quick to express his loyalty, he said, everybody may fall away, but I will not. Here was Peter, proud, thinking that he was superior to the others, thinking that he was better, thinking that even if other people fell away, he would never fall away. And we can learn a lesson from Peter, stumbling Peter, that it's so easy to think that we are better than the others, and when there is no fear in our hearts, then we fall away. What a contrast this is to Paul's attitude that we read in 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, where he says, I run in such a way, 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27, not without aim. I buffet my body, lest possibly, verse 27, after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. He knew that there was a possibility of his being disqualified. Therefore, he lived in fear and kept his body in subjection to the Lord and away from sin. And therefore, he never fell away. He endured till the end. It's that healthy fear we need of sinning, that healthy fear of displeasing God, a real understanding of our own weakness, our cowardice to stand up for the Lord, a real understanding of our inability. If we understand this, then we will not fall because we will cling to him. But here we see Peter self-confident and strong. Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. That is the word of a strong, self-confident person. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that you yourself this very night before a cock crows twice shall three times deny me. And here we see that the Lord has to break this self-confidence in Peter. And that's why he allows Peter to fail. And we can learn a lesson from this when we realize that Peter finally became the leader of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. This one who failed, this self-confident, proud person who failed, is the one the Lord broke and pick up, picked up to be the leader of the apostles. And that's what we can also learn from that incident, that the Lord seeks to break us so that he can make us into something useful in his church and in his kingdom. But that cannot be accomplished until our self-confidence is broken. He doesn't want people who are self-confident. He wants people who are shattered and crushed and broken so that they can find their strength in God. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 that the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, or my strength shows up best, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, in weak people. And that is a mystery. Paul said, I'm glad to be weak, because then the power of Christ can dwell upon me. What does that mean? Weak in the sense, no confidence in my own ability. No confidence that I can stand up for the Lord. No confidence that I can overcome sin. No confidence that I can be a true witness for the Lord, or that I will stand true to Him finally. No, such a fear. Oh Lord, I'll fall any moment unless you keep me. Keep me, keep me, keep me from ever doing one single thing wrong. And God allows us to fall and to fail again and again. We who think we are so strong, God allows us to fail, to be broken and to be crushed. If we will allow him, then he can build us up. The Christian world, believers, the believing Christian world is full of people who have never been broken, never been broken of their strength, of the strength of their self, the strength of their will, of their self-confidence, and the Lord has not been able to crush them, and therefore the Lord has not been able to build anything. The Lord has to reduce us to nothing 
before he takes us up and uses us and does his work through us. And that's why the Lord allowed Peter to deny him three times in one night, the one who boasted that he would never run away. But Peter kept saying insistently, verse 31, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. I think he was sincere. But he didn't realize his own weakness. And that's how many of us are too. We may be sincere, but we don't realize our weakness. And we fall and we fail so often, and yet we don't realize our weakness. When are we going to learn? God is seeking to teach us something. You are incapable of living this victorious life, of this overcoming life of following Jesus. You are incapable. You need to cling to me. You need to be like a broken person clinging to me. And oh, that the Lord could accomplish that work in us, making us like broken people clinging to him. And then we read in verse 32, they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. You see his graciousness there. He didn't send Peter away because he knew he was going to betray him. No, he took him because he knew he was sincere. The church is not full of people who have never fallen, who have never failed the Lord. The church is full of people who have failed and fallen, but who have been honest about it and who allowed the Lord to break them and who have been strengthened by the Spirit to come to a new life, strong in the Lord. And there are others who are learning this lesson. There are those who have learned it to some extent, but we, there's a sense in which we need to learn it all through life so that we cling to the Lord. And the Lord is so faithful to teach us all the time. If we can only be honest and allow the Lord to break us, God can do mighty things through any one of us. And he took Peter, James and John and began to be very distressed. When Jesus went to pray, he could have prayed alone. But as a human being, he didn't live in that self-sufficiency and strength of man. He needed fellowship in prayer. He needed to pray with Peter, James and John. It's a humbling thing to pray with others. We like to think we're strong and we can pray on our own. We don't need anybody to pray with us. But we need one another. We need others and Jesus needed the head does not say to the feet I don't need you and who are we to say to one another if the head himself Christ doesn't say that to any member in the body he took Peter James and John and he said my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death verse 34 mark 14 34 remain here and keep watch and he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began praying that if it were possible the hour might pass him by he prayed with great agony. What was he praying for? Verse 36. And he was praying, Father, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. The essence of his prayer for that one hour was, Father, take away the cup. What was this cup? What was the thing that Jesus dreaded most? Jesus didn't dread physical death. When we think of the number of believers who faced physical death so boldly, we can't imagine Jesus was a coward. He wasn't afraid of humiliation. There are believers who have not been afraid of humiliation. No, he was not afraid of physical death. He was not afraid of humiliation. He was not afraid of ridicule. He was not afraid of pain. He was not afraid of suffering. None of these things are the cup. What was the cup? The cup was that Jesus realized as he came near the cross that when he bore the sins of humanity on Calvary's cross, the father would have to turn his eyes away from him. And that fellowship which he had with the father from all eternity as the son of God would be broken for three hours the next morning on the cross. He had a sense of that. And that's what he dreaded. Oh, this cup of this broken fellowship. Father, does it really have to take place? Does my fellowship with you really have to be broken? Isn't there any other way out? Isn't there any other way out? It was a moment of weakness, not of sin, because he said immediately, not what I will. The greatest price that Jesus could ever pay was not physical death, that he would have paid a million times if needed. But that break of fellowship with the Father, which is what hell is all about. What is hell? Hell is not just a geographical place somewhere in the universe. The greatest agony of hell is not going to be a physical fire. It's going to be the fact that it is, in its true sense, a God-forsaken place. 
completely without any sense of God's presence or mercy or grace. This world is not like that. Even on unbelievers and atheists, they experience many of God's blessings. But hell, there's nothing of that. It's completely, it's complete break with God altogether. And that broken fellowship is what Jesus experienced on the cross, a complete break. For three hours, what he experienced on the cross was hell. And because he was an infinite being in himself, being God, he experienced in three hours the agonies of an eternal hell, which all human beings will experience, who don't trust in him, who don't repent of their sins. And that broken fellowship with the Father, which Jesus dreaded, was the cup. We learn something from that as to how much Jesus valued fellowship with the Father. That was the most precious thing to him in the whole world. There was nothing more precious to him than fellowship with the Father. He valued that more than anything else in the world. He was willing to give up everything else. But he was willing even to give up this if that could save us. There we see the depth of his love. The depth of his love is seen not just in the physical death on Calvary, but in the far greater spiritual death that he experienced. What is spiritual death? It's a break of fellowship with the Father. And that's what he experienced on Calvary's cross. And there we see the depth of his love, that which we don't understand fully, how wonderful it is. We have little tastes of it in our fellowship with God now. Jesus experienced it fully. He was willing to give up even that because he loved us that he might save us.